imagine the emotions that fill my heart and my mind at this moment. Looking at our family, the friends from Plains, the uh, people that serve with me as governor and as president, and have helped the Carter Center flourish for the last 28 years. I'm overwhelmed. I'd like for everybody that had anything to do with my becoming governor or serving as governor or president or just to raise your hand. All right. And, uh, governor, you can raise your hand. The people that didn't want me to be governor or president. <laughs> if he was a Democratic governor, I'm sure he would have brought me a president. <laughs> But he made up for it with his beautiful speech, and I'm really glad he's, he's doing a fine job as president. In fact, he and I came from the same background. We're farmers. We used to sell fertilizer and seed uh, to farmers, so we know each other, and I've admired what he's done as president as well. I have my favorite photograph right outside my office, and it's, in, it's a picture of me and Fritz Mondale in the Rose Garden. And underneath, uh, Fritz wrote, from a vice president, maybe who served with a person that he respected, but from a only vice president perhaps in history that loved his president. And I love him as well. I don't know if all of you realize the historic nature of this place. On top of the hill right behind us, where the flags are, is where Sherman's headquarters were. And right behind me on a little knoll is where he stood to watch Atlanta burn. And in a way that affected my life and affected the life of all of you, what happened with the war between the states. 600,000 of our kinfolks on both sides died. And it ended a time of slavery, which was a disgrace to our country. But I was born, along with many of you, during the next hundred years, beginning in 1865, when racial discrimination was still part of our legal heritage where the United States Supreme Court confirmed by the actions of the Congress and approved by, so far as I know, every distinguished lawyer in the country, said it's okay to have a segregated society. Well, like a lot of you, I was born at that time. And I think one of the most memorable things about the presentations that you'll see behind me in the new museum is the history of my 85 years of life, but also how they interrelate with your lives as citizens of America, and there's some others here who are my friends from other nations. We grew up under a stigma, and I was personally affected by it in a very troubling but also very beneficial way. I lived in a little community named Archery, about three miles west of Plains, Georgia. That's where we still live. I didn't have any white neighbors. All my playmates were African-American kids. I fought with them and wrestled with them and played baseball with them and fished in the same creek and worked in the same field. And it strongly affected my life because I started out with complete innocence about the damage that was being done to my family, prominent white folks, and the black families around us. We went to separate schools, we went to separate churches. And when I was about 14 years old, we went separate lives. I went on to become superior, and my playmates all of a sudden 
became inferior. And I, I saw then the ravages of, um, of a lack of respect for other people on an equal basis. And, and that really started my life off. And that story is told behind us in many ways. Later I was in the Navy, I was a submarine officer. And the first time I ever knew for sure that that had been wrong was when Harry Truman ordained under great condemnation that in the military services everybody was equal. And on my submarine overnight, the African and Hispanic stewards became equal to me. And ten years later, Rosa Parks, as you know, didn't sit in the front back of a bus and Martin Luther King Jr. became famous. Well, it's changed. Our country's changed. And, and all of that is told in here. And, and I think it shows that that's kind of a cycle of life where we learn from our mistakes and we correct our mistakes in a great nation where people can still speak up just a few at a time perhaps like Martin Luther King Jr. who preached just a few hundred yards from here and changed my life and changed the lives of everyone in this audience. We went on, I did, to get a good education and, and had religious beliefs embedded in me as a child. And I served my country and then came back home as a farmer and I was elected to the state senator and governor with the help of many of you. Tommy Irvin sitting back there was one of my good friends, still serving the people of Georgia. And it's been a chance for me to learn that all of us are in the same boat together. There's no distinguishing among us. And there's no distinguishing between us and those who live overseas, those who don't have a chance for a decent place to live or decent clothing or adequate food, no hope for an education or health care. Some people lack the opportunity for self-respect and an expectation that the future might be better than the present. That's what the Carter Center has done for the last 28 years with the help of many of you, our trustees and the audience as well. And, and I hope that when everybody goes through this new, exciting, dramatic, inspirational, educational, <laughs> inexpensive, <laughs> library museum that you put yourself in the role of all of us who share a common heritage and a common background and realize that each person can make a difference. One of the things that's impressed me, and this is the last thing I'll say, is how much we share from one generation to another. Even one generation of presidents and another. You'll see a presentation in the new exhibits of other presidential libraries, I think 11 others. And I've identified in going through my diary notes about 30 different things that troubled me and challenged me as president that exactly are still a major concern and responsibility of President Barack Obama 25 or 30 years later, the same things. Iran, the dream of peace in the Middle East, a comprehensive energy policy, a comprehensive policy for better health care for Americans, and I could go down the list. And that's important to know that we live in a changing society that still has things that don't change. Challenges, yes, but much greater opportunities. And I hope that every visit to the 
new exhibits will say, this is my responsibility too, to make sure that my children and grandchildren still live in the greatest nation on earth. Despite all its faults and tribulations, trials, mistakes, America has nurtured me. And I'm grateful for it. And grateful for all of you. Thank you very much. debating whether I should have preliminary remarks. <laughs> and I decided that I should. <laughs> God blessed me to have benediction inauguration of the 44th president. I'm almost just as proud have an opportunity to say a benediction at the 85th birthday of our 39th president. Sometimes we live so close to the forest, we don't experience the individual contribution of the trees. I think sometimes we live so close to this president. <laughs> I'm going to cut it short. <laughs> Where was I? President Carter in 85 today, uh, five days from now, I'll be 88. Oh. I'm, I'm allowed to forget something, <laughs> but I do want to reemphasize the blessing experience day after day by this community to have this institution and this president in our midst. Sometimes we take for granted those things that are so monumentally important to our past, to our present, and to our future. I had a joke to tell about the governor, <laughs> but I forgot it. <laughs> Let us pray. <laughs> Lord, we thank you as we close this celebration for the birth and the life presidency, the perpetual ministry of 
Jimmy Carter, given him as he extends his ministry. Thank you for his companion, his roommate, his loving, supportive wife, who's been of such immeasurable benefit to him and his ministry. Thank you for the past this institution. Thank you for what it has meant. Thank you for what it means. And now, Lord, we cry out from the depths of our being in thanksgiving for what this institution will continue to be. To those yet unborn, for education, inspiration, and motivation, and agitation. Mm -hmm. This president leaves a legacy of agitation. He gets in trouble every so often. <laughs> Speaking truth to power. Thank you for our presence here. Thank you that you have led us to come to this place to be a part of this magnificent renaissance. Thank you, Lord. Bless now our country. In the midst of turbulence, this institution, this president, this family exercises a stabilizing force. And we know that while we may be in the midst of some turbulence, if we hold on to our faith, Hold on to our firm commitment that this nation will be the land of the free and the home of the brave. That in a little while, when the morning comes, the clouds of darkness and turbulence shall be rolled away. We shall enjoy a brighter day, a day full with a full measure of freedom and the spiritual strength that has characterized the presidency and the extended ministry of Jimmy Carter. Thank you now, Lord, for this institution. Bless all of those who work here, who labor here, who have contributed through the years, who will contribute in the future. We thank you that we're here in this time and in this place to be a part of this glorious blessing that you've given Atlanta and Georgia. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, let all those who love the Lord and Jimmy Carter say amen. 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 I said he forgot to take up offering.
say thank you to all our great speakers today.